Can we give our God a great shout of praise? I know you got a mask on, but can somebody lift your voice all over this room? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Anybody agree that we serve an awesome God? Anybody glad to be here today? Anybody glad to be online today? Come on, I see y'all in the comments. Hey! Yes, Lord, we are so glad. Yeah, there's a presence, the presence of God. There's power in this place. Anybody feel the power of the Lord in this room? Anybody feel better already? I believe that we're getting ready to experience the best of the Lord. I know you might have had some good days and some good years and some good moments and some good paychecks and some good testimonies and some good things that happened, but God's best is yet to come. Just tell somebody, go ahead and tell them, say God's best is yet to come. All right, I, I, I don't know if y'all ready. Find somebody else because that person looks shady. Find somebody else and tell them God's best is yet to come. That means I can look forward with faith because God's getting ready to do something that's going to, can I just speak faith to you? God's getting ready to do something that's going to blow your mind. God's going to exceed your expectation. Whatever you hope for, God's going to do that and more. Somebody shout, we serve a big God. Come on, you got to say it like you believe it. We serve a big God. Hey, now if you serve a big God, can you give a big God a big praise all over this place? Make his name big all over the room. Hey. Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. We serve a big God. I'm excited to be included in the bigness of God. It is good to be at Motivation with you today. We are in a new season. Somebody shout a new season. I know we're still dealing with the pandemic. It ain't over, but it's over. <laughs> Y'all didn't catch it. Maybe Wednesday at 3 o'clock, that's going to hit you. It ain't over, but it's over, which means that I'm still in it, but I have the victory over it. Okay, y'all ain't, ain't ready. I guess I'm going to preach on top of y'all today. I might be in it. Okay, forget the pandemic. Some of y'all might be in debt right now, but you already have victory over it. There's some things that seem like it's been getting the best of you, but you already have victory over it. And let me tell you this. You don't have to be out of it to have victory. The fact that you're alive in it with your right mind, with your sanity, with your smile, with your peace, with your joy, you have victory over it. Can somebody praise God for victory? Hey. Okay, y'all will catch up. Y'all ain't ready. Y'all gonna catch up because I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I have great expectation for what God has already started doing in this season. God's releasing and he's outpouring and he's doing something that I don't even have all of the words to articulate, but I can sense it in my spirit that God's best is yet to come. And I know that might seem like a cliche. It might seem like something, oh, you're supposed to say that, Pastor, I know. But let me tell you this, those that receive that by faith, those that believe that by faith, you don't need nobody to convince you because you already know it in your spirit. And when you heard me say it, something just shook up in your soul because it was a reminder that you're not crazy. See, sometimes, okay, y'all ain't, ain't ready for me. Sometimes people think we're crazy because there's something in our spirit spirit that they can't sense but when you get with somebody who's crazy like you are and they say something that only you thought of in private and now they said it in public it makes your baby on the inside of you leap are there anybody are there any people in here that got something leaping in your spirit when I said God is big when I said you have victory when I said God's best is yet to come am I in the right place am I on the right channel I'm just saying are y'all ready for God's big. All right, all right, y'all. Okay, all right. Y'all playing games today, so I'm just going to preach, and y'all will catch up. Let's go to Genesis chapter 22. We've been in a series. Uh, we've been in a series called The Crosswalk. This year has been our, this year has been our uh, year, our theme this year, our focus this year. We heard the Lord say to walk with me. 
And as we're talking about walking with God, I've been sharing some things about faith, and I've been sharing some things about challenges. And sometimes um, in our walk with God, we lose sight of the walk and the journey because of the things that we're challenged by. And many people have uh, the misconception that if I walk with God, things would be easier than this. Am I talking to anybody? Maybe this side, y'all standing and ready. I, y'all, they sleep. Let me see if y'all, I'm just saying, yet, you know, have you ever been in that place where you thought if God was really a part of this, it would be easier? But I've learned in my walk with God that sometimes when you walk with God, it makes you more of a target for ad- adversity. And I'm, and I'm going to talk to you today about this because what I'm learning is sometimes it's God bringing us through certain things to show us that he's really with us. The evidence of the, I say this all, the evidence of the favor of God is not that everything's going the way you want it to. The evidence of the favor of God is when all hell breaks loose, but you haven't lost your mind. Yeah. It, it's easy for people to think, oh, they're rich, they're blessed, they got this, and God is with them. No, there's some people that should have died already, but God has been with you. You had the sickness, but God has been with you. The evidence of God's favor is not when everything is good, it's when I can still smile in the midst of everything being being bad. I'm, I just want to go to Genesis chapter 22 and we're going to read verses 1 through 8 and I'll do my best to try to preach a little bit but I feel God in this place and so if I don't finish I'll just we'll just praise God where I end. Is that all right? Will, will you do that? Will you be my praise partners? So come on right where you are at home in the building. Come on let's stand together for the reading of God's word in Genesis chapter 22 I'll read the NLT today. We're going to read verses 1 through 8. When you got it, somebody shout, I'm ready. ready. Sounds good. Sometime later, God tested Abraham's faith. I'm already preaching. I don't know, Sam, if I can finish it because he gives us the cheat code. He gives us the answers to the test before the test. God tested Abraham's faith. Abraham, God called. Yes, Abraham replies, here I am. God says to Abraham, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, who you love so much. Take the thing that you love and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him. Sacrifice your son. Sacrifice what you love as a burnt offering on one of the mountains which I will show you. He's taking him on a journey. So he doesn't know where he's going but he's going somewhere. Just tell somebody we're going somewhere. He says the next morning Abraham got up early. He saddled his donkey and took two of his servants with him along with his son, the one he loved to sacrifice Isaac. Then he chopped wood for a fire for a burnt offering and set out the place God told him about. On the third day of their journey, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Stay here with the donkey, Abraham told his servants. Now watch this. He he tells them, I see it. I sense it and I see it. So we're going to stop here. He tells the servants, check this out. He tells his servants, this is dope. He says, the boy and I will travel a little farther we will worship there and then we will come right back I don't want y'all to miss this God tells him take your son and I want you to sacrifice him he says cool he's obedient he goes to do what God says he gets to the place that right, y'all chill here me and him are going to go and worship and we'll be back Somebody say, we're on a comeback. We're on a comeback. We're we're coming back. We're coming back. We're coming back. I want you to catch it. We'll come right back. Verse 6. So Abraham placed the wood for the burnt offering on Isaac's shoulders while he himself carried the fire and a knife. This is so crazy. As the two of them walked on together, Isaac turned to Abraham and said, Father, Yes, my son, Abraham replied. This is how cold this is. He says, he says, uh, we have the fire and the wood. The boy said, but 
Where is the sheep for the burnt offering? Where, where's the sacrifice? Abraham says, God will provide a sheep for the burnt offering, my son. Abraham answered, and they both walked on together. If it's not obvious, I'm going to preach from the subject. It's only a test. Just tell somebody, it's only a test. You can be seated. You can be seated. I just, I, I pray for preaching power right now because I, I sense something. I'm excited already. Thank you, Sean. Let, let me tell you this. I am unapologetically an 80s baby. And as you know, when I preach, I only like to preach facts. The fact is the 80s babies are the greatest generation. And I'm sorry if you don't agree, but you've been wrong before and we'll forgive you. Now, if you're not born in the 80s, God still loves you. Just not as much. But when I grew up, it was a different time. Things were different because we did stuff outside. I don't know if you ever heard of that. There's a place called Outside. And we didn't have to wear masks. We used to go out and play. And, and sometimes we get lost in playing, but we were young. We didn't have watches. But there was a general rule when you play outside. How do you know? We didn't have cell phones. Our parents couldn't text us like these spoiled brats right now, three years old with cell phone plans. We didn't have all of that stuff. You know how we knew when it was time to come home? When the lights came on. Y'all know what I'm talking about. I'm just, we, we knew when it was time to come on, all the millennials are like, I don't know what he's, what he's, what is he talking about? What is this out, you're Googling outside, you know, but, but we knew. And, and, and then when we came in the house and we'd have to go wash up right away because our parents used to say things like, go wash up because you smell like the street. Yeah, and, and so we have to go and get, I don't know what kind of church this is, but we, we have to go get ourselves together, and, and we would come in the house, and we do dinner, we do all our stuff, and then if it was like the weekend, you get excited because you could stay up later, but, but here's how we knew what time it was to go to bed. We knew what time it was to go to bed when it was late, because you could be watching something on TV, but all of a sudden... All of a sudden, you'd hear the national anthem come on. And when that national anthem comes on, when it's over, TV is off. There's no more television. Y'all like, what is he talking about? My kids have no clue. You didn't get 24-hour service. There was no DVR and rewind. And, and, and it was a different time, but there was something that used to frustrate me, Mike. There was something that used to bother me. I would be watching TV. And while I'm in the middle of my favorite cartoon, I'm watching the wrestlers uh, at WWF back in the day on Saturday with Junkyard Dog, with Mr. Fuji. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real wrestling. I'm not talking about the fake stuff now. I'm talking about real wrestling. I I'm talking about Coco Beware, Tito Santana, Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh, yeah. I'm just saying, I this is the greatest generation. And, and we'd be watching it, and Macho Man would get on the the top rope and he'd do his move and he's getting ready to jump and all of a sudden there would be something that came on and go boo and it would say something like this this is an emergency broadcast system we're coming to let you know this is only a test and it would interrupt our program and it would let us know that we're just checking your system to make sure everything's working we're coming to make sure that everybody receives this message we're sorry to interrupt you but we're trying to make sure that we're connected just in the event that we have to get you some information that you couldn't get on your own I have to interrupt your program with a test and I hear the Holy Spirit telling us while we're walking with God that he's coming to interrupt our program with a test. Tell somebody it's only a test. And so we see in this text, I can't even play with y'all today, we see in this text that, that Abraham is in an interesting position. The position that Abraham is in is that he went through this process. We preached about this before. Abraham and Sarah finally have a son. And at this point in his life, he's been walking with God for a little bit. 
And in his walk with God, we know that he was 100 years old when Isaac is born. But here's the crazy part. We already know he had Ishmael issues because God promised he was going to be the father of many nations. He was going to bless him. And he thought God needed help. So he said, God, I'm going to help you. And he goes and he sleeps with Hagar. Hagar gets pregnant. When she gets pregnant, now Sarah regrets her decision to let his boy get a little something on the side. And so now she's like, she got to go. Has a baby. He gives her a little bit of money. Tells you, Hagar, you and Ishmael, y'all got to go. And he starts raising Isaac. Isaac is the one that God said the promise is coming through. God God said he is the one that I've predestined for purpose. He is the one that you've been waiting for. And so he says, I want you to trust me. He trusts me. Trust God. He keeps sowing seed. Him and his wife finally, without the help of Viagra or any other things, they have faith. And faith, the seed of faith, allowed him to birth something that he couldn't do on his own. And Isaac is born. We love that story. It's He's the child of faith. Ishmael is the child of flesh. And we see as we move forward that he continues to walk with God. God tells him something that was familiar to him. He told him in the past, he said, listen, I'm getting ready to bless you. But before I bless you, you have to go to a place that I will show you. Means I'm going to bless you. I'm going to do something with you, but I'm not going to tell you where. I'll let you know when you get there. You just have to trust me on the journey. So now we fast forward and he hears God again and God says a familiar thing to him. He says, go to a place that I will show you. Now it's easier for him to trust God this time because of what God did the first time. And I want to tell you that even as you walk with God, the reason that God takes you, thank you, you can throw it. Oh, yeah. The reason God takes you through tests and through trials and different things is because he takes you from faith to faith and from glory to glory. So the first time you almost lost your mind, you wasn't sure how to handle it. But after your experience and encounter with God, now the next time something happens, you know how to trust him better. But the challenge is God doesn't give you the same test. God will give you a test that's bigger this time so that you can build and develop your faith. And so it is that he's walking with God again, and God says something familiar. He says, let's go. I want you to now give up what you love. Oh, God, I know y'all, but I'm about to lose half the room. God tells him, if you really love me, if you really want to worship me, if you really trust me, give up what you love. Put what you love last. Put yourself second and put me first. And can I just pause here and tell somebody the real, the real way that you show God how much you love him is by where you place him. We can sing, I worship and adore you, I love you, Jesus, and all that. But really, the evidence of your love is where you place him. And he says, position me in the right place. And and so we see this now. He goes and he says, I want you to sacrifice the one you waited for, the thing you worked so hard. You finally made it. You finally got what you believed me for. But now I want you to give it back to me. I want you to give it up. And and notice he's telling him, I want you to do this, but he doesn't tell him what the end result is going to be. Sometimes we, tr- we, have you ever created a bargaining process with God? Like you could sense, you could sense God wants you to do something, but you're like, okay, God, I'm going to do this, but. <laughs> or you try to hold on to a little bit of it just in case. <laughs> the just in case saints, you know, just in case he don't really come. Th- I'm not going to give all, I'm not going to give a hundred. I might give 95%, but I got to hold on to that five just In case, God says, "Uh uh-uh, I want you to give up everything. He starts walking with God, and here's what's dope. And and I tell you, 90% of people who take notes when I preach go to heaven, you're going to need this stuff. This is going to get good. But but understand, when we see this text and we start seeing this, he, he tells him, go to a place I will show you. When they start walking, the Lord reveals to him, I want you to go to the land of Moriah. This is very important. The land of Moriah. The word Moriah or the name Moriah. It's going to get good. It it, it means, first of all, uh, Yah, meaning God, right? Yah means God. Uh, Mora means terror or awe-inspiring. 
So when you put it together, uh, and, and Yarai means fear or revere. So when you put Moriah, when you put it all together, watch this. It means a place of inspiring awe of God. So God says, I'm taking you to the place where I will put you in awe. Oh, God, I hope somebody catches this. So here's the first point I want you to write down. God, when he's testing you, he will interrupt you with inspiration. When you're going through the test, God will interrupt you with inspiration. God will put you in a place of awe. <laughs> it's going to get good. He, he tells him, I want you to sacrifice your son on a mountain I will show you. In other words, you have to be willing to give it because God won't accept what you don't offer. That was so good, I'm going to take a sip of water. Ah, it was good. I want you to catch it. You, you, you have to be willing to, everybody say give it up. Because God's not going to accept what you don't offer. Many of us have the mindset, if God wants it, I'll just let him take it. No, God don't want to take it from you. He wants to receive it from you. And some of us are, are missing our opportunity of blessing because we're waiting for God to take something that he's waiting, us for, waiting for us to offer him. He says, go to a place that I will show you what you need to show me. Watch this. What God needs to show us, he can't show us until we go. Okay, there are some things, when we started Motivation Church, there were some things God showed me. But there were things that God wouldn't release until I went. So, okay, let me say it this way. God's not going to send the people until we start the process. We're waiting for the people before we start the process. We're waiting for the money before we make a move. God said, uh-uh. You, okay, you, you're waiting for the ring before you become a wife. Oh, my God. You're you waiting for the girl before you become a husband. No, the Lord said, make a move first, and then I will show you. It's the, Everybody say, then I will. See, the then I will of God is every time you're expecting something from the Lord, it really starts with you. It starts with whatever you're willing to do, then God will. If you want to be healed, believe by faith, then God will. If you want to be blessed, you have to give first, then God will. Whatever it is, you need the then I will moments. He says, I will bless you, but you got to do it first. Look at somebody say, do it first. He says, go to the place I will show you. So what we need to happen, what we're expecting from God won't happen until we go. Somebody shout, go for it. The, the next part of this is now Abraham's moving to the place of Moriah. God speaks to him and he senses. The Bible says that he sees. Verse 4 and 5. It says he sees the place and he tells his two servants to wait here. He says, me and Isaac are going to worship, and we will be back. Here's the second thing I want you to write down. God will push your flesh to promote your faith. This is key. This, this, this is key right here. God will push your flesh to promote your faith. Now, here's the thing I need you to understand. This is the revelation God gave me in this, is that when we think about the test, we say in our humanity, right, with good intention, we say stupid things. Yes, sir. As preachers, we say some stupid stuff. Things like, God is just trying to test you so that he can see. Now, when the music's going, watch this. Sean, give me something. And God is trying to show you. He's trying to test you so he can see. So, so you see how that felt? It felt good. We'll go there, but, but it felt good. God's not testing you so he can see what you're going to do. And I, and I even took it to the next level. I thought God was testing us so that he could show us what we would do. 
But that was too low. That was too immature. God tests us. Write this down. It's going to change your life. The reason God tests us is to show us what he can do. Oh, my God. This is good. <laughs> this is good. It was never about us. It was always about him. Uh, this is why it's important to have the proper perspective when you're being tested. Because the moment you make it about you, everything becomes subjective. Everything starts becoming selfish and emotional. But when you know it's not about you and it's about God, then you take the pressure off of yourself. And, and, and I don't know, I don't, I don't know who needs to hear this, but somebody has to let faith have it. Somebody can just write that down and say, let faith have it. God pushes your flesh so that he can promote your faith. So to get to faith, you first got to go through flesh. Because there's a, there's a place that each and every one of us in our faith walk, in the cross walk, in our walk with God, there's a place that's called the waiting place. There's a place all of us are going to get to and moments that we're going to get to where we're going to be tested. And part of the test is the waiting place. It's the place where others can't go with you. It's the place of pause. He's walking. He got his son. He got the sacrifice. And he has his two servants. When, when he's getting to the place that God showed him, everybody can't go with him. Oh, my God. And, and, and it wasn't because they sinned. In the text, they didn't sin. They didn't cuss them out. It didn't say they were like, are you sure? I believe, according to the text, that they were probably helpers. Because they were his servants, and they went without a problem. They weren't complaining. We don't see complaints. We don't see them lacking faith. We don't see them saying, hey, let's pray about it. They just go. But even then, there are some people that can't go with you. There are some places that God wants you to go alone there are some places that that waiting place sometimes you have to be isolated so that God can deal with you because they're the points in your life where God will call you to a place of separation and separation's uncomfortable because you want to fit in I, I like to fit in I like to walk in the room and be able to shake hands and know people and feel comfortable. I, I, like, I like when I, I'm comfortable in a place and I know people. I, I like that, but it's, it's very difficult when I go to a place that I'm unfamiliar and I don't know anybody. Now I get quiet. Certain qualities and characteristics about me kind of pause and chill and hide because I'm trying to fill the room and I'm uncomfortable. Sometimes God calls you to a place of separation because he's trying to do something. He's trying to get your attention and he's trying to become intimate with you. Yeah. It would be in a, oh, can, can I go here? It would be inappropriate for my wife and I to be intimate in public. Be crazy. It, 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 it would be weird. It'd be like, oh my, what is going? What kind of church? <laughs> there are some places, even with God, where it's appropriate for Him and you to be alone. It's the place where He wants to expose some things to you that's not for everybody else. <laughs> It's the waiting place, and, and that waiting place can be uncomfortable because I don't know what to expect. I don't know what he's going to say, and I don't have support around me that can explain it to me. This whole pandemic should have taught us something about intimacy because we're in a place where we don't know what's next. There's no experts that can write on pandemic. There's no people that can tell you how to feel and what to think and what to do and what not to do. So we're feeling our way through the dark, and we're trying to figure this out, and sometimes it's like that walking with God. You're feeling your way. You're facing your way through the dark. You don't know what to expect. You don't know what to do, but you're just listening. And sometimes in even walking with God, you're waiting for God. You can be walking and waiting at the same time. Even, oh my God. And let me tell you this. Even in your walking, even in your waiting, don't stop walking. Tell somebody, don't stop walking. Yeah, because sometimes in our waiting place, we think that means stop walking. No, he never told them to stop walking. He said, while you're waiting, keep walking. And I will show you. 
But he tells them, he says, you got, you got to pause. You can't go with me. So, so when God's testing you, watch this. He's trying to give you revelation. God wants to give us understanding and he wants to give us revelation. And in order to receive revelation, he has to give us separation. I was a rapper in my former life. Forgive me. We see it because even Jesus, when he's with Peter and he's with John and James and, and he goes to the mountain to pray, right? He says, all right, y'all, wait right here. And it says Jesus goes a little further. Why? Because he's about to become more intimate with the Father. See, intimacy requires separation. Intimacy is calling you to a place sometimes. It doesn't mean you're weird, but it's okay to be deep. And can I just make this comment? I'm tired of Christians saying, oh, not trying to be deep. No, we need to get deep. We're too shallow. There's so many of us that don't know any scripture beyond God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Great. You've known that since you were five. What else? What else? Let's go deeper. Let's be deep. Let's say some stuff because if we can't be deep, if we don't have revelation, then nobody will have revelation. Who do you think God's going to speak through? He gives revelation to his people, but to get revelation, you need separation. Is this helping anybody? Watch this. So he tells him, he says in verse 4 or 5, he says, go to this place. Me and Isaac are going to worship. It's interesting because I I learned this, that worship does not become real until it's a sacrifice. Now, I know we sang songs and you were in here. The king is here. Boom, the king. Yeah. That felt good, right? But, but real worship, that ain't it. Real worship is when you have to do that. <laughs> My son died, but the king is here. I'm homeless, but I love you. I lost my job, but God, you're worthy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sick and the doctors don't have an answer, but Lord, you are good. So y'all don't understand. Worship is not worship till it's a sacrifice, till it requires something of you, till it costs you something. It's more than a beat. It's more than a song. If they never show up, if Lady Ray never picks up the mic, it doesn't change my worship. Because as he reveals, it births something in me. It causes me to see him in a different way. It causes me to say, yes, Lord. Everybody say, yes, Lord. And, and, and so he has, to, he has to move our, faith, uh, our flesh. So watch this. Even when, even when we're in worship, we have to get beyond our flesh. That's why worship is not about how you feel. Worship is about who you know. And the more I know him, the more that worship births is birthed through me. And that's why you don't have to waste your time trying to encourage people and be a coach and a worship cheerleader. Now everybody do this. Come on. You're not serious. Come on. Do you really love the Lord? Come on. What's going on? No. I can tell who's desperate. I can tell who's hungry because you don't even need a song. You ain't even waiting for them to play something. You got your own song. You, oh, God. You, you got your own song. You ever play a song in your head? You ever just zone out because God has been so good and you're just glad that you're alive. You're just glad you've been reminded about his faithfulness and his goodness and everything about him. You don't need a band. You don't need a singer. You have a song that's on the inside of your soul. Mm. And so he says, I got to move past. I got to move past your flesh to get you to a place of faith he says we're going to worship and and we'll be back let me hurry up i don't want to bore you uh so abraham he's in this place with god he's walking with god and and here's the interesting part he gets to the place right he's like all right it's, it's time for worship when he gets to the place of worship it says that Isaac on his shoulders, he's carrying the wood. He's carrying the wood, he has a knife, and they start a fire. Carries the wood, has a knife, 
starts a fire. Carries the wood, starts a fire. Pocket knife, pocket check, homie. He's got it. He's, he's going into worship. And here's what I've learned about worship. Can I tell you about true worship? Because remember I said it's a sacrifice? Write, write this down. This is big. When you really mature and understand what worship is, God will make you carry what can kill you. And, and, and all of this that we see, I, I hope you catch this because this gets deep. B- because that's how you really know that God is with you. He's carrying something. Here's the good news. He's carrying something that has the ability to kill him, but not the authority to kill him. Oh, my God. So he's coming into worship with all of the elements for sacrifice. He's coming into worship carrying something. And I want to know who came into church today carrying something. There's some of us that are carrying thoughts and feelings and emotions and our heart is broken and we got so many things consuming our mind and dealing with our, 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 our heart, issues of the soul. We're carrying some stuff that has the ability to kill us. It, other people went crazy. Other people got addicted to something. Other people lost their mind. You came into worship carrying something that had the ability to kill you. But the good news, it didn't have the authority to kill you he's he's in this place he's carrying something Isaac says to his dad he says um all right dad look we we have wood fire the knife uh oh you forgot something dad Abraham's like what what I forget he said there's no sheep for the sacrifice he said there's no there's no sheep for the sacrifice and Abraham was like are we good God will provide. Now think about this. Think about how shady this is. God gives Abraham a word to sacrifice your son Isaac. He's talking to the sacrifice as if he ain't the sacrifice. Like I know what we're about to do, but you don't know (laughs) what we're about to do. He starts speaking to him in an interesting way. He says, God We'll provide. Here's, here's point number four. Write this down because this is important. God will provide where he guides. Wherever God's guiding you, he makes provision for. Okay, I used to say it like this. If it's his will, it's his bill. That helped you a little bit better. And here's the thing. When we walk in faith, we don't have to know how, we just have to know him. Sometimes we focus so much on the how that we forget about the him. (laughs) When I remember the him, I don't focus on how. How is about flesh. Him is about faith. When I focus on him, I have my faith intact. When I focus on how, I'm letting my flesh take the wheel. And some of us have to shift our perspective right now because I may not know how, but I do know him. And because I know him, I know that he'll never leave me or forsake me. I know because I know him, I know that me and him are always the majority. Because I know him, I know weeping may endure for a night but joy come on somebody say joy joy is gonna come in the morning because I know him I know he'll never put more on me than he can bear because I know him I know that he has plans for me that are good because somebody say I know him because I know him I know that I don't have to deal with this sickness because he was wounded for my transgressions he was bruised for my iniquities the chastisement of my peace was upon him and by his stripes I am healed because I know him I don't have to know how because there's nothing too hard for God he's he's dealing with some stuff and they get to this place at verse 9 We're almost done uh, they arrive at their destination and when they arrive at their destination It says that Abraham says, stop. He says, uh, let's build an altar. So Isaac now takes the wood that he had, 
that he was carrying. He lays it down, starts the fire. He arranges the wood, strikes the match, gets it all together. And Isaac, watch this. Uh, this is something interesting it says. I, I'm glad you pulled it up because I want you to see. I want you to think I made it up. When they arrived at the place where God had told them to go, um, Abraham built an altar and arranged the wood on it. And here's the tough part. Then he tied his son to it. He, he tied his son to it and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Write, write this down, point number five. God doesn't want you touching. He wants you tied. We'll, we'll break it down. God doesn't want you touching. He wants you tied. He wants you tied. Um, can, can I show you something? Uh, Jedi, come in for a second. I got, I got to do this. My, my second oldest son, he's, he's the tallest in the house. Those are some nice sneakers, man. You got some sneaker swag. Sneaker swag. All right. So, so this is Isaac. This is I now, now it's funny that I'm doing this. Um, come stand in the frame with me just in case. This is Isaac. He's no longer Jedi, he's Isaac. Now it's funny, out of all seven kids, he's the only one that we asked for. <laughs> <laughs> Like Kyrie showed up, we were like, "Dag, okay, cool. <laughs> Go hug your brother after, all right? Kyrie showed up, it was like, all right, cool. And so we said, you know what, um, Lord, we need another child. Kyrie's four now, and, uh, we need. and so we prayed and prayed and sowed seeds of faith. <laughs> and Jediah showed up. And, and, and here's the thing. Isaac, Isaac, remember, Abraham was old at this point. Isaac was young and strong. Now, he still can't beat me in a fight, but Isaac probably could have beat Abraham in a fight. What? Oh, all right. Um, <laughs> watch this. But, but Abraham does something that's so dope. He tells him, don't get mad. He says, uh, I'm going to tie the wood to you and lay down. Yeah, lay down, boy. We didn't rehearse. Sorry. Don't break that phone. All right? He says, he says, lay down. And he says, you got to lay down. And I sit down. Lay down. Lay down, fool. All right? He says, lay down. Uh, when he tells him to lay down, he doesn't just tell him to, to lay there. He ties him to the wood. Him being tied to it meant that he was committed. A lot of us like to touch, because if I touch it, I can let go of it. I, when I touch it, it's about convenience. When I touch it, it's about how I feel. No, no, he said, in order for your worship to be successful, in order for you to pass the test, you got to be tied to my will. Oh, my God. And, and, and watch this. Isaac, this, this is dope how it flips, because this is, remember I told you, it really was never about Abraham. It was really about God because this is an example of what Jesus is going to do in the future, that he is the obedient son who says, I'm going to lay at the will of my father and I'm going to be tied. Somebody say, I'm tied to it. And just, oh God, just like he's tied to the wood, Jesus was tied to the cross. I hope y'all don't miss that. He, he's, somebody say, I'm tied to it. Jesus didn't just get tied to the cross. He got nailed to the cross because he was committed to the outcome. And so Isaac has to lay here. The sacrifice has to be tied to it, not just touch it. He has to be tied to it. Many of us are touching church, but we're not tied to it. Many of us are touching ministry, but we're not tied to it. Many of us are casual and convenient. But God said, if you're going to bear up your cross, you can't touch it. You got somebody shout, I'm tied to it. And God is looking for somebody who is going to be tied to it when it's hard. Who's going to be tied to it when they don't have the money. Who's going to be tied to it when people don't agree. Who's going to be tied. To Somebody shout I'm tied to it. He tells him. He tells him. He doesn't want him just to touch it. He wants him to be tied to it. 
And, and watch this. Many of us will just lay down but not get tied. And to be tied meant I had to be committed. So now if he wanted to get up, it wouldn't be easy. Oh, my God. This is the difference. Those that are touching, when it's hard, they get up. Those that when it's hard and they're tied to it, it's not easy to get up because they're connected to something bigger. They're holding on to a weight. And there's some of us that God has taken to a new place. And through this test, he wants to tie you to some things. He wants to see if you're going to see it through. He's going to see it. He wants you to see how faithful he's going to be as you do what he's called you to do. Somebody shout, I'm tied to it. And in the midst of it all, God tells Abraham, Abraham, this is it. This is the moment. He's laying. He's tied to it. He said, <laughs> he gets the knife. I, 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 I got the knife. Oh, y'all don't even know. See, y'all missed that. Yeah. Anybody know about the golden child? See, y'all like, y'all, y'all better watch some movies this weekend. You ever seen the golden child? You did? You sure? You didn't see it, Mike. You seen it, Sean? What? Sam, you seen Golden? What? As? Oh my God. What kind of church? I, I, I want the knife. I, I, I want. It's a biblical movie, I'm telling you. That's y'all's homework this weekend. Watch party, Golden Child, Motivation Church. And the crazy thing is, you know that's a little girl, not a boy. Anyway. He picks up the knife. Ah. Now, it seems easy when we read it. <laughs> but this is what he prayed for. This is what he waited for. This was his everything. So I'm, I'm thinking about as a father. I don't know why God... I don't understand. I can't see it. You didn't tell me anything beyond this. But, now Jedi is praying that I don't open this water. Remember that payback? Jaden, remember that payback I owe him? <laughs> He's sweating. <laughs> He's untying himself. No, he picks up the knife. And right before he strikes, God says, hold up. Wait a minute. What kind of church. I could imagine Abraham with tears in his eyes and sweat in his brow. He's, he's wondering and waiting because he looks foolish because he said, we'll be back. Sometimes faith will make you look stupid. What are they going to think if I come back? <laughs> And I don't have what I said I was going to have. And, I, and, and in faith, you have to make a decision. Are you going to trust him or are you going to please them? I mean, that's just says. So I got to let the thoughts of what the crowd will say go. What will my friends think? What will my peers think? What will the church think? What will people think? What will other pastors think? What will my family think? What will they think? Because you know what I sacrificed to get to this point. You know what I went through. You know all this stuff. Now I'm supposed to just let it. I'm supposed to just let it go. I'm supposed to just leave it. You know how hard it took me. You know how much work I put in. But, 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 but God. But, but, but you know what? You know what? You, you know what? As hard as it is it would be harder to live with him than to live without him let me say it again it will be harder to keep living with him than to live without him and the test is really a choice to see where your heart lies it's really a test for you to see what really matters because when God asks you to give up something it's not that he wants anything from you he's really positioning you to give something to you but he can't can't give something to you if he's not first. So Abraham has to make a decision. He's he's his heart because he don't know what it took. You don't know what it took for me to get here, and you don't know the tears, and you don't know the fights and the arguments, and you don't know 
you don't know for me to get to this point, but you want me to do this. You want me to leave what I've known and let go of what I've loved. And, and God, I, I got to just, it's not easy, but it's necessary because there's more. There's, there's always, and I hear the Lord saying, there's always more where that came from. <laughs> and if I supplied you then, I could do it again. He has to make a decision. In the midst of it, the Lord says, stop. Wait, chill. He says, get up, come on. He says, get up. Take your phone. He says, you're good. He, he says, get up. He, he stays committed to see it through. When he stays committed to see it through, it's then that he hears from heaven. Heaven won't speak until I'm committed to the process. Heaven didn't speak until he was obedient. Stop looking for new direction where you didn't follow old instructions. God, what's next? Uh, what was? You can't go to next if you don't handle then. What did I tell you to do? And here's point six. I got to let y'all go because I know I'm boring you. Point six. It's your obedience that makes the blessing appear. It's when he was obedient that God said, wait. Don't kill him. On the other side, there's a ram in the bush. So there's two things that we see at work, and I got to let you go. He recognizes God's provision after he experiences God's direction. God shows him that he's a provider after he shows God that I trust you. When he's obedient, now God releases and reveals something that he couldn't see before. While Abraham, because because can I keep can I give you something? Rams don't climb high in mountains. So how is it that there's a ram in the bush? How is it that there's a ram at the top of this mountain when rams don't even climb to the tops of mountains? The ram is there. So Abram's coming up one side and God's provision is coming up a side that he can't see. And the provision is coming at the same time Abraham is coming. But if Abraham never continued, he would have never met the provision. Your provision is where God wants you to be, not where you want God to meet you. So God's already provided but you can't see what he provided until you get to where he said go. So uh, obedience to instruction is key for God to release provision. And he gets there and there's a ram. God, oh my God. And I was asking God, I said, God, this don't even make sense. Why don't you have a sheep up there? Why don't you have something else that climbs high in mountains? And, and what I believe the Holy Spirit said and what God showed me, just revelation, is because sometimes God will break rules to bless you. <laughs> sometime, sometime God will bless you in a way that's so stupid it don't even make sense. Oh, there was a ram. Wait a minute. There was a what? They knew rams didn't climb that high. God wants to bless you in a way that's so big it's stupid. Doesn't make scientific sense. Doesn't make logical sense. But God will break the rules to bless you. God will create PPEs just for you. Stimulus checks. 
scholarships. We're looking for somebody short and fat. Oh, here you, you, you go. Thanks. <laughs> they got all kinds of scholarships out there. God will create stuff. They will make positions at jobs just so that you get hired. They will. God has a way of breaking rules to bless you. God has a way. And I want to tell somebody, I don't know where you're on the process, but, but encourage somebody as you stand and tell them it's only a test. Go ahead and tell them. It's only a test. Yeah, come on, tell somebody else it's only a test. Come on, tell somebody else right online. Come on, come on. I see you, Aunt April. Tell them it's only a test. I see you, Kim and Shauna. Tell them it's only a test. I see you, Gael. Tell them it's only a test. D. Williams, I see you. Tell them it's only. Come on, somebody shout it's only a test. It's only a test to see what God is going to do in your life next. And God is showing us. What is he showing us? That he is enough. Come on, somebody just shout, he is enough. <laughs> Come on, say it like you believe it. He is enough. Come on, somebody shout, he is enough. He is enough. Come on, somebody shout, he is enough. Come on, somebody shout, he is enough. Come on, somebody shout, he is enough. Come on, say it like you believe it. Say, he is enough. 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 How much more does he love? Yeah. How much more does he love? How much more does he love? Yeah. How much more Come on. does he love? If he dresses the lilies. If he dresses the lilies. With beauty and splendor. With beauty and splendor. How much more? How much more does he love? How much more will he glory? If he watches over every sparrow, every sparrow. How much more does he love you? Come on. How much more? Come on. If he dresses the lilies, if he dresses the lilies with beauty. come in your life. Does anybody receive that today? 
Anybody receive it today? And even as God blesses us, I believe we're in a season of sacrifice. There's going to be some things that God's going to start requiring you to put last, to put second, to move from being first. And I sense this heavy in my spirit past two weeks. This has really been heavy on me. I was sharing with some of our leaders yesterday. But I think we're in a season of sacrifice that for what God is doing and where he's taking us and what he will show us, it's sacrifice. And I'm not just talking about money. I'm not just talking about offering. Let's raise money. I'm not just talking about that. That could be part of it, but it's not all of it. There's some, we might have to change our schedule. You got to wreck your agenda. I'm not fussing, but I'm pastoring. Some of y'all are in a small group because it's your gym night. Let the gym go. Not in small group because that's my night out with the girls. What? You want God to show you something? But you can't give up ladies night and move it to another night or give up going to do your two hours at the gym to another time? God wants you to put, to, he wants you to want to put him first. I got class, I got a lot of schoolwork, I got this, but I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to change my schedule, put my schoolwork to this time so I can make sure I'm a part of what God is a part of. Don't miss what God is doing in this season. And I know I'm saying this as small groups. I'm talking about everything. But even in my heart this morning, I really had a burden. And I, I said, Lord, and he started really dealing with me on small groups. Small groups is a big thing for us. It's a big part of our growth. It's a big part of discipleship. It's a big part of connection during a season of isolation. If you're not in small groups, get in small groups today. Sign up, email. It's not too late. We'll figure out a place. We'll create another group. I want every motivator on there. And we're online, so there's no excuse why you can't make it. And turn your cameras on, please. Because they're going to kick you out. Next week, if you're on there without your camera, they're kicking you out. Pastor Jay said, be mad at me, not them. We have small groups for our teenagers. Get your kids in small groups so that they can grow in their faith. There's no excuse why our kids aren't on there. I'm not beating you down. I'm building you up. We have things available so that we can grow. What good is it if we pack this church and we have thousands online and you're in the same place spiritually a month from now? I know every pastor ain't going to tell you that. I don't care how good our offering is. If we aren't doing what God called us to do, keep your money and we'll close this church. There's something that God is making available for us. Somebody shout for us. Let's make what God has made available already a priority. And as we do that, I believe we are going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. We're not going to have enough services to, to, to meet the needs of people. There's going to be too many, too many people. We're going to have to open up churches all over New England and all over the country because there's people that are going to be itching not just to watch online but to come in person and get a touch. And God is raising up some of you as ministers, as deacons, as pastors, as elders, as leaders, as worship leaders, sound people, as gatekeepers, as mad team, as men, as whatever you do. God is raising up people. And God raises you up by testing your faithfulness. And if we're not, okay, Lord, I hear you. If you're faithful to the little bit. I will make you ruler over a lot of it. Stop praying for God to bless you if you're not willing to be a part of what he's already blessed. That means that our agenda changes. Look at your schedule and make adjustments this week. Dr. Vernon said, don't make excuses, make adjustments. 
And I'm not just talking about for small groups. I'm talking about time for prayer in your own life. How many times should I pray? A lot. What's a lot? A lot, a lot. Well, when? Well, when you think about it. Should I pray now? Well, pray now. Let me tell you something. Well, I, somebody said one time to me, I don't know if I should pray and fast, so I pray about praying and fasting. I said, that doesn't even make sense. Well, I just want to make sure I'm not being deceived by the devil. I said, the devil will never lead you to deny yourself. You've never seen the scripture where the devil's like, deny yourself. Put your plate down and hear from God. There's some things you don't even have to pray about. I sense it, I feel it, do it. When it comes to prayer, <laughs> be careful. Be clear. Pastor Jay said, y'all be wilding out in these streets. But understand what I'm talking about. Change your schedule in this season. Make yourself available for God. You might have to stay up later. You might have to get up earlier. I don't know what you got to do. I don't know what you have to turn off. I don't care. And, and watch this. For some of us, we have to give more money in this season. Listen, I'm not afraid to talk about money. Two things people want in church is sex and money, but don't want to talk about it. And if we look in the New Testament, two of the things that's talked about the most is sex and money. Oh, y'all don't like my preacher no more. God bless you. You won't be back next week. <laughs> Jesus talked more about money than he did the kingdom. Anyway, here's the point. For some people, God wants to bless you financially, but it's going to require you to give more first. So Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts might, be, might not be your portion in this season. The extra Chipotle may not be your portion. You might have to cut your budget a little bit so you can give more. Not because, oh, the church needs it. Because Pastor Jay asked, no, it ain't even about that. It's about because God is doing something in you. And this is a good place to sow. This is the place where you benefit from what you sow. For some of you, you have to make a decision to sacrifice your time in this season to serve in ministry more than you ever have. I don't know what to do, but I'm available. Y'all hear what I'm saying? I want to make sure I'm clear. Like, it's not just one thing. It's everything. God's challenging you to change your agenda. It's only a test. And I learned this with God. Whatever he asks you for is not to take from you, but it's to give more to you. My daughter one day, Jaden, we were doing something. Sorry, I didn't ask you if I could say it. One day, she got some money. And um, I said, Jaden, um, let me borrow... She had like $150 or something. I don't know. She had like $100. I said, yo, I need it. Let me, let me borrow $100. She looked at me like, you don't need my money. And I said, oh, for real, I, I really need it. I'll give it back to you in a couple of weeks. She was like, Dad. And I said, no, I just, just let me borrow $100. And she wrestled with it. And I was testing. I said, all right, you going to let me borrow? Because I need, I need to know because I'm trying to do something. <sighs> Fine, here you go, Dad. I got you. When are you going to give it back to me? I don't know, Jaden, like five weeks, six weeks, I don't know. In a few weeks, I just, I just need it right now. I need to borrow some money. She was like, all right. And I laughed, and she was just like, and I handed it back to her. And I think I gave you a couple dollars on top of that. I think I gave her a couple extra dollars. And I said, I really didn't want what you had. I really had something for you that I wanted to give to you. But I wanted to first see if you would be willing to give to me. And because you are willing to give me what I asked for, I'll give you what you didn't even ask for. Oh, my God. I'll give you more than what you expected. Can we pray? We got to go. I'm all late. It's 121. Y'all ready to go home, huh? <laughs> I just feel the presence of God in this. Anybody feel his presence? He is out. Can we lift our hands all over this place? And we're going to pray, but I, I just hear it. Come on. If he dresses the lilies. If he dresses the lilies with beauty and splendor, how much more will he clothe you? How much more will he clothe you?
stop right there. Okay, okay, okay. I just, I couldn't move off it. I was just thinking about God and how he, he hooks us up. It's just in my spirit. But Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your test. Thank you that it's not for bad, but it is for good. Thank you for how you're developing us in the process. Thank you for what you've prepared for us through all of this. And God, help us to see our way through it, to trust you all the way to the end. And we thank you that as we trust you and walk with you in this journey, that you continue to provide rams in the bush, that you have miracles waiting for us. Lord, in this season, we're letting go of our excuses and we're willing to make adjustments. Do the work in our heart so that you can do the work through our hands. And God, we give you glory, honor, and praise for what's coming. <laughs> we thank you that the best in you is yet to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, can we give our God a great shout of praise? <sighs> What a great end to the Crosswalk series. I hope you all have enjoyed every single nugget that was dropped. If you didn't get it, you gotta make sure you go to YouTube and get caught up on all of the messages in this series. Listen, I told you before, you gotta stay connected on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, it's all below. You see the, the usernames below, gotta go there. Go ahead and just type it in. Make sure you like, make sure you subscribe. We love to have you here. We're so excited that you came today, whether you are online or in the building, and we can't wait for so much more that's to come. All right, one last thing to do before we go. If you missed your chance before, we have our giving options below. We wanna make sure that we're continuing to give back to our community, just as God has given to us. Now, it's been a great day. We hope that you enjoyed service. We pray that you were blessed and we will see you next week.